this is the fourth session, yes, I'm counting them right, the fourth session of our Spring Creativity Conference, and I'm pleased to, to introduce my former student, uh, uh, Jared Kimling, who wrote a wonderful dissertation on Kassira that he and I argued about for two and a half years. Um, he won the argument. Um, Thus, I get to sit here. Thus, you get to sit here right. now. And he's now uh, assistant professor of philosophy at Rin Lake College. And that was also uh, uh, a happy thing as far as I'm concerned, because whereas uh, an awful lot of my favorite conversation companions go far away, uh, Jared stayed close enough that we can still talk. So I really appreciate uh, the fates um, or whatever Japanese gods may be responsible for Jared's remaining here. Um, he's actually the editor of the volume uh, that is going to be composed of some of these papers, plus actually a lot more, uh, coming out from the uh, book series that is associated with this institute. It's the SUNY series in American philosophical and cultural thought. And that's out under review now. I'm optimistic about its chances for you guys who are contributors to it, partly because John Shook and I are the editors of that series. So <laughs> Shook is overseeing this one because I have a paper in this volume as well. Uh, it's going to be a really, really interesting book. It's going to be like the most interesting philosophy book of 2021. That's what I think. It's going to be the one that you actually sit down and you want to... Oh, we'll get a blurb for you to put on the cover. Yeah. And... Well, I can't put a blurb on the cover because I'm in it. But, <laughs> find but, somebody else yeah, to say Find that. somebody else. But, but I'm not kidding. I mean, this is a really, really interesting thing to talk about. It goes across all kinds of disciplines. It goes across history. It goes across cultures. Uh, and it turns out this is something that everybody really has in common. That uh, and, and part of the reason I say that is because your paper is the most... How should I put it? It's pretty abstract. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, and if anybody's going to answer the question, what does all this really have in common? It's. Uh, I noticed that you put your essay last in the book. In the book. Yeah. Yeah. You might have put it first, uh. but uh, but but in any case, you guys are in for a treat, uh, a feast of Kassirer Kassirerin analysis of a very complex subject and uh, across the realms of cultural cultural practice, consciousness, the formation of consciousness, and symbols, and that is what uh, Jared is going to talk about today. And so uh, without further delay, I turn it over to Jared. Right. So uh, as Randy said, the first part of this paper will be a little bit more like technical, philosophical, and abstract in some ways. But after that, it should get better. And then at the end, I promise to talk about Alice in Wonderland. Okay. So like, if you can make it through uh, all this like phenomenological description and things like, or maybe that's what you're here for. And which, so I'm trying to hit all bases here. Uh, so the paper is titled, titled A Personalized Cultural World, A Kassirin Phenomenology of Personalized Intuition. And I'll talk a little bit about intuition and why I'm focusing in on this particular level uh, at the beginning here. So I want to start by noting that uh, a full account of the form of personalized experience. So what I'm trying to do is give a, a phenomenological description of personalized experience, experience which has a personal character to it. Uh, that would require a full tracing of the phenomenology of Geist for Hegel in its personalizing aspect, and such a phenomenology in the Kassirin sense would require a full account of how personalized experience develops through what he calls the expressive, the representative, and the significant stages. Okay? Each of those stages corresponds to a certain kind of experience. Uh, that he borrows from Kant, basically. Uh, we have sensation, intuition, and conception, right? So the expressive stage of this form is characterized by sensation, uh, literal the basic sense experience, the representative stage by intuition, and the significant stage by conception. So there's Kant lurking in the background here, and Kant will come up a few times. Uh, I'm warning you. <laughs> How is personalized sensation distinct from mythic sensation, right? So the idea, uh, and we don't dive so far into Kassir, but the idea is that each of these is a sort of a symbolic form unto itself, right? And so that myth is its own sphere of symbolization, its own sphere of culture, uh, and we have science, and we have religion potentially, and all these different spheres, and each of them has their own sort of um, Hegelian development, something like this almost, right? Um, and so my question is, well, what about personalized experience? How is that distinct from 
mythic experience, linguistic experience, religious experience, etc. Uh, and so to fully do this, we would have to trace that through all three of these levels, right? So intuition, uh, sensation, as well as conception. Um, okay. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have time to do all of that. Even in my dissertation, I don't have time to do all of that, and certainly not here today. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be narrowing just to that representative stage. Okay? Uh, that representative stage is the one that gets associated with intuition. Um, so if, again, remember for Kant, intuition is where space and time start coming onto the scene, right? So uh, the, the first sort of primal experience takes on spatiality, takes on temporality, right? And we can start sort of describing our experience indexically. Oh, this thing here now, right, within a certain space and time. And obviously these pure intuitions and all this for Kant is complicated. And even more complicated for Kassir is that he adds number, right? So he's got space and time and number at the, these pure intuitions, okay? And we don't have time to dive into that, but it is strange. I will admit that much, right? Uh, so, and these become intuitive experience in the Kantian sense. So that's what I'm focusing on, this kind of intuition, right? So when does personalized experience enter into uh, spatiality, temporality, and numerality for Kassir, right? Um, I'm skipping over a, sort of a comparison here to Merleau-Ponty and making the point that I'm not doing quite the same as his phenomenology of perception, but there you go. Uh, and then this is the caveat that I have a whole dissertation on this, right? So lying in the background of the present work is a broader project in which I argue that the human tendency to personalize the world is best understood as what Ernst Kassir has called a symbolic form of culture. Uh, and thus, that this human energy of personalization is just as essential to the project of humanity as Kassir says language, myth, science, religion, or any other symbolic forms uh, would be. So I'm adding a symbolic form to Kassir's list, basically. So further, I argue that the symbolizing function, form and function are big things for Kassir. Kind of, we can think of this as the transcendental engine uh, which creates a personalized cultural world is best understood in terms of what Gabriel Marcel has called creative fidelity. Okay, so Marcel will pop up here and there, but we're not going to be diving into creative fidelity in depth or anything like this, right? Uh, but this is a kind of making oneself available, right, to the world through an active stance of promising and reaffirmation. Marcel is a French sort of Christian existentialist, and so a lot of generic uh, existentialist themes show up in interesting ways in Marcel, right? Um, so while I'm not going to discuss Kassir's use of symbolic form or, Mar or Marcel's use of creative fidelity, uh, those concepts are relevant foundations for the phenomenology I'm doing today. So that's all in the background, but what I really want to do is ask this question of how does personal experience take on space, time, and number? How does it enter into uh, experience in an intuitive way? intuitive in the Kantian sense. Okay, so in order to make an attempt at a phenomenology of personalized intuition, I'm going to follow Kassir's general strategy, which he adopts from Kant, of going through and examining the unique way in which the personalizing activity of creative fidelity, this function, spatializes, temporalizes, and for Kassir, numeralizes. Uh, we must outline the analog of Kant's transcendental aesthetic, uh, but now applying that to a personal symbolic form. Okay. So by outlining the pure intuitions of a personal world, pure intuitions in the Kantian sense, uh, my hope is to obtain adequate understanding of any personal symbol, at least in this case as it's given in intuition, not necessarily as it's given in perception or in conception, uh, regardless of the content. So if I do this right, any personal experience will be hold up under this description, right? at least at this level of intuition. Okay. So in other words, we need to construct a positive account of the form of the personal. Personal. All of it, right? Only then can we have reliable insight into the content of a personal world. As Kassir says, quote, determination of the pure form of knowledge must precede determination of the object of knowledge. So this is a formal phenomenology, right? Uh, a positive description of the personalized cultural world cannot simply be a description of various personalized, personalized experiences, although it must be at least that. We must also articulate the symbolic form of this cultural world, the structure of the personal, 
as it is manifested in our intuitive and ultimately we would also do sensible and conceptual experience. Okay. For each symbolic form, Kassir following Kant shows how the relevant symbolic function, form, function, serves as the ground of a kind of pure intuition, that is how each symbolic function spatializes and temporalizes and numeralizes in its own distinct way. Thus, each symbolic form arises with a characteristic form of intuitive perception, and these forms of intuition allow us to identify pure intuitions, space, time, number, belonging to each cultural horizon, right? So myth has its own way of spatializing, temporalizing, numeralizing, as does language, as does any symbolic form, and so I'm trying to figure out how uh, personal experience does this. Uh, so the pure intuition of mythic space is not the same as linguistic space or scientific space. Space means something different in each of these contexts. Okay? Uh, in explaining the personalized cultural world and the personalized objects or experiences that one encounters there, we must not apply pure intuitions borrowed from other forms. Meaning, you can't talk about personal experiences the way that you talk about mythic experiences or linguistic experiences or religious experiences. Right? We need to come up with a, uh, a w the way that space, time, and number function for personal experiences or personal objects, right? Uh, okay, so for the purpose of articulating the personalized intuitive cultural world, I will use a three-dimensional analysis following Kassir, composed of the pure intuitions of personalized space, time, and number. Remember that for Kant, an intuition is, this is a very technical definition, an objective, and therefore cognitive, immediate, singular, what he calls Vorstellung, presentation or representation of an object. This distinguishes intuition, so I'm giving the Kantian distinction between these levels. This distinguishes intuition from sensation, or sensatio, which is subjective rather than objective. And likewise, intuition is distinguished from cognition or conception, what Kant calls cognitio conceptus, which is objective but is mediated, right? So intuition is objective but immediate. Cognition is also objective, but is mediated in a way that intuition is not. Right. Uh, space, time, and number are unique among intuitions and in that they are pure in the Kantian sense that, quote, no sensation is mixed in with the presentation. Okay, so Kant, right? Nor is any sense experience necessary for the experience of space, time, and number. This is Kant's argument, right? You don't need any particular experience to understand the form of these intuitions. The pure intuitions are not empirically observable in themselves, with no sensation at all, but constitute the basis for empirical intuitive perception itself. These three are, as Kant would put it, intellectual concepts rather than sensuous concepts. This distinction must not be forgotten or we will have committed the fallacy of subreption. Laura's not here, but... She'd be Thou happy. Thou shalt not subject. Right, exactly. She'd be happy. So as Cagill succinctly, succinctly summarizes, space and time, and therefore number for Kassir, are pure a priori intuitions, quote, they are pure insofar as they cannot be derived from either the power of sensibility or understanding, a priori and that they anticipate or are presupposed by sensible perception, and intuitions in that they coordinate a manifold without subsuming it in the manner of a concept. The role of number for Kassir and thus myself is a complex issue that requires further elaboration, but number may be preliminarily understood as a pure intuition along the same lines as Kant understands space and time. All right, that's the most like abstract bit. So I'm just doing my like Kantian duty of saying like, this is all the stuff in the background and remember Kant and all this kind of stuff. So. Now we get to actually start talking about space, time, and number in a personal sort of context, right? So, space, personalized space, which I am going to uh, call the space of responsibility. Okay. The first task is to establish a form of space that remains personal, unique, and does not fall into a pure field of anonymity and indifference. This would be a non-personal experience, right? Such a space would be explicitly non-Cartesian. So this is not a Cartesian plane of the XY, et cetera, et cetera, right? We're, not that that's inaccurate, but that's a different form of culture than personal experience would be. 
So in and as much as this would be mathematizable, the most general description of such a personal space would be mariotopological rather than primarily algebraic, which is to say it's a flexible realm of whole and part that is qualitatively variable rather than merely quantitatively variable. That will have to be fleshed out oh, sort of as we go. Personalized experience cannot survive a transformation into the sorts of objects that belong essentially to a depersonalized space, for example, a Cartesian space. And so we must establish a new kind of spatiality in order to account properly for this kind or this type of personal experience. Okay. So what am I doing? I'm trying to understand space. When you're having a personalized experience, when you're encountering any of the sort of the objects that people are describing, the corn mother or a tsukumogami or something like this, right? What kind of space are you inhabiting in that experience? That's the question, right? So it's a simple matter to think of spaces and places that have personality. Uh, maybe this is different for different people, but a church, a cafe, maybe your favorite cafe, a mountain, a clearing in a forest, a small stream, right? Uh, rivers and so forth. Each of these might have a qualitative unity that announces itself as a unique personalized space. So you encounter this and you recognize that it has an identity as a person of some kind, right? Uh, the question is, what is the quality of spatiality that supports and characterizes experience of this type? How should we describe it? Specifically, how do we describe it without falling into other types of spatiality? In particular, we need to take care not to think of personalized space in terms of mythic space, because personal experiences and mythical experiences are quite close together. And so then part of the th thing here is to distinguish what a personalized experience is as not mythic in sort of a Kassirian sense, right? Um, right. The primary sense of mythic space, according to Kassir, arises out of a dichotomy of the world into the sacred and the profane. This is Mercia Eliada, other sort of similar things, right? It is this differential movement that creates mythic space. So mythic space is a differential field of sacred and profane, if that makes any sense to say. Okay. However, it does not seem necessary, at least to me, for an experience of personality that we should set the experience in such black and white opposition. It is misleading to say that a space gains personality by relegating opposing space to a region of the profane. So I'm saying that personality is not the same as the sacred. Okay. So what then is the differential element? I'm going to be doing a different, each of these has a differential axis, uh, axis and a uh, integral axis, right? So space uh, opens up as a region, but it also concretizes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's a field, but then within that field, there are also uh, holes, unities, identities. And so we have to understand how space opens up and then also how it concentrates. Uh, so first, I'm going to start with the differential. What is the differential element that articulates the pure intuition of space in creative fidelity? Not extension, which would be Descartes, right? Not the sacred, uh, so this is scientific form of culture, mythic form of culture, respectively. We require a qualitative differential that provides for the perception of personalized experience. When you see a personal object, what kind of space does it occupy? Uh, rooted in the symbolic function of creative fidelity. Okay. The differential element of personal space, I believe, is best named as responsibility. There's a lot of Marcellian overlap here. Uh, responsibility is what we mean by creative fidelity when we spatialize it, when we formalize it spatially. Personalized space is a nexus of topological regions of responsibility, a responsibility that emerges from creative fidelity. By responsibility, I mean not merely that I am held accountable for this or that spatial object or region, although there is, of course, a sense that this is so, but also that this object elicits a response in me and calls me to act on its behalf. Right? So personal space is not a space of the sacred or the profane. It's a space of, of response, of feeling responsible. I'm responsible to this thing, but maybe not to this thing or something like that. And that qualitative difference is the spatial uh, region in which personal experience occurs. So thus, it is not simply I who am responsible. It is also the personalized cultural world. Responsibility is a qualitative attribute of the objective space within which personality exists. 
It is the ability of a personalized experience to elicit or demand a response in me. Responsibility is the spatialized counterpart of Marcel's disponibilité. The space of responsibility is the region in which I must make myself available to respond. Okay. To say that responsibility is the differential factor in personalized space means that on the ground of the form of creative fidelity, we perceive that object as occupying a region that either demands or elicits a response in you or does not. So some things I see and it, it, elic it demands a response from me, right? Uh, it could be a work of art, it could be you know, a sacred mountain or something like that, whatever. But this thing has a personality to it. Right. I feel a, a response. There's a, a demand for sort of recognition. Okay? Uh, okay. Yes. However, to posit the differential function is also to demand the integrative or integral function. Responsibility functions in both directions. That is to say, responsibility not only differentiates by integrating, it integrates by differentiating. What a nice philosophical thing to say. Uh, qualitative spatial holes within personalized experience are experienced as holes, as integrated. So what makes this thing it and not something else, right? What is the boundary of this garden or the corn mother or, you know, any of these examples, right? Why, why do we experience it as an identity, as a whole? Um, so qualitative spatial holes within personalized experience are experienced as holes, integrated, on the basis of their differing demands for a response or variations in responsibility. This object is perceived as separate from that because this object demands a response, but not that object. In the very process of distinguishing this from that, we introduce difference, but also integration, personal holes. We have both the subjective differential side of spatiality, my responsibility to the world, and the objective or integral side of personal spatiality, a world populated by qualitative personal holes who elicit a response in me. So, of course, remember that for Kassir, there's not just Kant in the background, but there's Hegel, right? So this subjective, objective pole and the sort of, you know, the development of that. Okay. Thus, the integrative or differential we could also say objectivizing, subjectivizing, quality in a personalized spatial plurality is the quality of responsibility. A space is experienced as a region of responsibility when the person is acting on the ground of the personalized symbolic form that arises from creative, creative fidelity. Your church, your favorite restaurant, the spot where you propose to your husband or wife, these spaces are not merely integrated or differentiated from other spaces by being beside another space or because it is sacred while other places are profane. Does that make sense? For Descartes, for sort of a scientific kind of space, space is just things that are next to each other, right? In sort of a Cartesian plane sense. For mythic space, th th things are sacred or profane. That's how you differentiate a space. This is sacred, and I bound it, and I recognize it as such, and this is not, this is profane, and that's what creates space, that's, right, in a mythic context. But, you know, the, in these examples, right, you, the place you propose to your husband or wife or a garden from your childhood or something like that, it's not that they're just next to something else, right? Oh, the garden is next to the gas station or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Like, that's not what makes it personal, right? What makes it personal is that I have responsibility to this thing, but not to that what's, that's over there. Or at least it's a, a field of responsibility, right? It fluctuates. Here is a more intense responsibility. Here is a, a lesser region of responsibility. Okay? Okay. To approach such spaces in these ways uh, would be to remove them from the sphere of the personal. So if I just start thinking of that garden from my childhood as like Google Maps would show it, it's not personal anymore, right? It's only personal when I see it in this sort of field of responsibility. Uh, so rather, personalized spaces must exist within a horizon of responsibility, a responsibility that is an enduring manifestation of the creative fidelity that made them available as personal. Personalized experience depends logically upon a pure intuition of personalized space, although that space always arises contemporaneously with such experience empirically. Personalized space of responsibility is one axis of the form of personalized intuition. Not intuition generally, remember, but rather that derived in particular from the personalizing function of creative fidelity. 
I'm going to have to hurry up here. Um, so that's space, now time. So we're going to do space, time, number. Uh, now that we have discussed the pure intuition of personalized space as governed by responsibility, we can move on to a description of the pure intuition of personalized time. Um, just as personalized experience has its own spatiality, it has its own temporality. Okay. Not only can we experience the difference between that which is spatially personal uh, and that which is not, we can also account for how personalized experience arises and expires in personalized time. The differential integrative element of personalized time, that which projects the internal intuition of personality, I say is hope. Hope is what we mean by creative fidelity when we temporalize it. So the region of personal space is a region of responsibility. The axis of time is an axis of hope. Okay. Just as responsibility is linked to Marcel's notion of disponibilité and therefore to creative fidelity, as the highest manifestation of availability, we should not be surprised that hope is also fundamentally tied to disponibilité. This is true not only for our purposes in this work, but for Marcel himself. Uh, okay. I'm going to skip some of this because I want to try and get to the stuff at the end. So time is hope, right? So Marcel, <laughs> as an act of hope, means an openness and an availability to something that may transcend the finite. This is, there's Royce and I quote Duane and some of that stuff in there. But uh, So something that may transcend the finite, that may be more than that which demands a response in the present. When you make yourself available to a sick friend and let them know or let him or her know that you will return. This is kind of a Marcellian example, right? You commit yourself in the act mm -hmm. and rise above the vicissitudes of time and induce such that, that induce such anxiety in us. This is all Marcellian language. Mm -hmm. You have hope that your fidelity, your faithfulness, right, uh, will stay the course in the future, that you will fulfill the act you have committed yourself to. Each act of fidelity, therefore, expresses a hope that your experiences and you yourself are not indeterminate or anonymous, that you are here, that you are available, and that you will be available to a friend, to the, that garden, to anything, any personal experience. Um, you have this commitment, this uh, axis of hope, right? In this sense, hope reaches toward the dynamic eternal. It affirms that your availability is not conditional, will not waver with time, not because your availability is removed from time, but because it exists ideally within time. Whether or not such unwavering fidelity can be actually reached, who knows? However, there is hope, and hope at least must affirm such an ideal. Okay, so it is in this sense that Marcel's articulation of the orientation of hope to the eternal needs to be considered. This reaching toward the dynamic eternal is the integrative or objective function of hope that you are, in fact, your ideal self. The self which will always remain present and faithful to your sick friend, or that a beloved family member is always with you, ideally. Hope integrates the personal world in this temporal sense as ideal unities in the eternal. So just to summarize, because I had to skip some of this, right? Uh, we have space and then we have time, okay? When you're having a personal experience, uh, the space that opens up here is, an, is a space, again, that's metaphoric because we're talking about time, right? Uh, is a temporality of hope. I have this feeling of hope, and then that stretches me out into the future and carries from the past, right? So I have a, a differential element, but I also have an integrating element, and that integration is an integration towards the eternal, towards the ideal, something like this. So I hope that I uh, represent that eternal ideal of myself or something. So does that, if that makes any sense, that, so that's why not only do I exist in duration, but I also have a sense of myself temporally as this thing, right? This being that bears hope and is, remains hopeful. You don't think about saying I do when the preacher asks. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, right. uh, maybe, exactly. maybe I do. <laughs> so yeah. like, ideally, I do. There's a, so there's a, there's a temporality <laughs> yeah, to that that's experience, the point. right? Like, yeah, yeah. And, it's, is a long and, it's, and it is a long time, but it's also, yeah. you yeah. have to, yeah. this creative fidelity, you have to commit yourself exactly. to that. Exactly. 
right? You're, you're in. And by <laughs> committing yourself to that, you also concretize yourself in a certain temporal duration, sort of a Bergsonian duration, yeah. right? Uh, so, okay. However, the hope cannot include merely an orientation to external permanence. As a pure intuition, hope has both an integrative permanence and a sense of succession. This is that that I'm talking about, that is grounded in the eternal ideal permanence, otherwise known as duration. This sense of personalized duration is the way that hope functions as the differential subjectivizing element of personalized time. This is what makes me a subject, right? That I have duration, uh, but in a personal way. In hope, we extend ourselves beyond our present, even as we carry with ourselves the responsibility of past fidelity. Hope is what pushes us forward. It is the ecstatic, in sort of the Heideggerian sense, E-K, ecstatic, right? Uh, being outside yourself. Hope is the driving engine that encourages the growth of personalized experience, the temporal expansion of fidelity. The object is integrated in the ideal eternal, even as, as it is differentiated and expanded upon within a durational present. The tension between this differential and integrative function is the tension which subtends our personalized experience in its temporal mode. Uh, yes, so moving on. Okay, I know this is a lot, but space and time. They mean something different when you're having a personal experience than when you're having, you know, like a spatial scientific experience or a mythic experience or a linguistic experience or any of these kinds of things, right? And then last we have number, which is it's a whole own thing. But basically, I am arguing that the personalized experience of number in this Kassiran sense is what I'll call community. So you have responsibility, you have hope, and you have community, okay? So space is a space of responsibility, time is a temporal access of hope, and then number, which is kind of this part whole complicated thing, uh, we understand as community. So experiencing community is the way that you experience personalized number. Okay. Just as creative fidelity has its own mode of spatialization and temporalization, it must have its own mode of numeralization. Fine, 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 fine. <sighs> Okay, I, yeah, I believe that the personalized form of number is best understood as community. That is to say, community is what we mean when we numeralize creative fidelity. Just as the spiritual act of creative fidelity creates a differential and integrative spatial field of responsibility and a differential integrative temporal field of hope, I believe that creative fidelity opens up a differential integrative numeral field best described as community. The axis of number, admittedly, is somewhat harder for us to grasp than space and time, which have been more privileged historically. With the term community, I hope to provide something familiar and concrete to grasp in the struggle to understand our numeric intuitions in the way that responsibility and hope hopefully do as well. A numeric object is not a spatial object, nor is it a temporal object. It, its part-whole relations cannot be understood as side-by-sidedness or succession or duration. And yet numbers do have their own mode of togetherness, synthesis, and discursiveness or analysis. So, like, if we're drawing this, the intuitive fields, we've got space, you've got time, and then you've got this z-axis for Kassir, which he calls number, right? I could very quickly. Most people would go with space-time and causality as the third. Kassir chooses number because he doesn't think that causality goes all the way down. Yeah, well, it's very complicated. It is very complicated, but the point is most people would say space-time and cause. He says space-time and number because he thinks number does go all the way down, yeah. and the cause is a version of number. So that, real fast, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> to find myself in community with a person or object or place and so on represents a kind of togetherness that does not hinge on spatial proximity. And it represents a kind of aloneness that does not depend on temporal succession. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You can have community across any sort of distance of space or time or something like this, right? Mm -hmm. And so to understand community, we can't just talk about it in terms of space or time. There's a third sort of thing, right? right? right. Uh, in this way, uh, it can be understood as a kind of numeric togetherness and aloneness, just as a number is in communion with other numbers, even if it is thereby isolated from them. Specifically, community is a personalized form of number. It is personalized number. When you take a number and make it personal, you get a community. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's a transformation when you're just talking about like the census is coming up, right? Oh, 2,000 people, 10,000 people. That's, that's just number. That's 
Cartesian number, by the way. There's linguistic number, there's scientific number, there's lots of different kinds of number, actually. But if you want to talk, like, just saying, oh, 15,000 people live in Carmadale, that doesn't, that's not personal, that's impersonal, right? But community is the kind of numeral togetherness that is personal, okay? Uh, so even as creative fidelity numeralizes us into an objective communion, not just among human beings, but also the community of place, object, and so on, we also become aware of those experiences which do not commune with us, which remain silent or even object to us. Right? Even as community objectivizes our world through integrating communions, it also subjectivizes our world as ego by making us aware of the hidden character of communions which we are not a part. This is the differential aspect of community. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I, am, I, am, I belong to some communities, and I understand that there are other communities of which I am not a part. Right? And, and so that both gives me an identity, and it also gives me a sense of difference. Right? We could Deleuze or something like this, right? or whatever. Um, any sort of you know, process philosophy, whitehead. Um, yes, yes, yes. So my assertion, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about that. Skip that, skip that, skip that. Uh, just as for Marcel, my ideal self exists in eternal hope while I experience duration, so too does my ideal, fully realized, actual objective self exist in community, even as I find myself outside of a complete communion. Another way of saying this is that if I were to find myself fully actualized in full communion with all possible communities, objects of fidelity, I would no longer exist as a subjective consciousness. This is a little dig that I don't have time to fully dive into, but okay, fine. All right, so that's it. That's the, that's the whole analysis, basically. I'm going to summarize that a little bit and then move on to some concrete examples. Fair enough? How are we doing? Okay. Now that we have described the specific way that creative fidelity spatializes, temporalizes, numeralizes, we have a sense of the symbolic form in its representational stage at least, of that cultural horizon that accompanies the functional act of creative fidelity. Responsibility, hope, and community as the expressions of the form of personalized in intuition are conditions for the possibility of personalized intuitive experience as we know it. In other, why, in other words, in the sort of this Kantian sense of pure intuitions, if you want to have a personal experience, if you want to experience an object as personal, as having personality, you need to put yourself in the space of responsibility, in the time of hope, and in the number or numerality of community, right? So without, and, and again, in, in a very specific technical sense, without responsibility and hope and community, you're never going to have personal experiences. Everything will be impersonal, objective, uh, dehumanizing, whatever word you want to think of. Or purely subjective, mere expressions. Oh, here comes the idealist. Okay, well, never mind. Well, let's not get into it. Okay. I don't have time. <laughs> later, later, right, later. Right, right, right. right. Uh, okay, 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 okay. That's fine. Creative fidelity, blah, 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 blah. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. So I have, I think I have time for two examples, hopefully, right? Um, the first is the idea of a wedding ring, okay, as a, this idea of a personal experience. And the other is Alice in Wonderland, because I wanted to use like a literary character. Okay. The choice of a wedding ring is a simple one when starting a consideration of personalized experience in the light of creative fidelity. A wedding ring is a symbol of fidelity, almost par excellence, in modern American culture, and is often considered to be an object of immense personal value on the short list of objects that you would need to be grabbed if the house was burning, for example. <laughs> so a wedding ring, either newly worn or passed down uh, the generations, is imbued with a very definite personalized form of meaning that separates it and perhaps even elevates it from other similar forms of jewelry, precious metals, and the like. Which is to say, uh, you know, so I have a wedding ring here. They probably made a bunch that were just like this, but this one is mine, <laughs> right? And this one is different, it's special. Not because it exists in a different, like, Cartesian space, like that would be the Cartesian kind of difference. No, this one is personal to me, right? Does that make sense? And so I'm, I'm uh, examining this uh, uh, example, right? Uh, the wedding ring does not possess meaning that can be reduced to its economic value, nor can it be reduced to linguistic, mythic, or scientific forms of meaning, although you can talk about it in these forms, that's fine, but that it can't be reduced to that. So then, how do we begin to speak about this particular form of meaning? What separates a personalized wedding ring from any number of seemingly identical, identical objects? 
uh, to the point that even if you purchased the quote unquote exact same ring after you lost the original, you would still feel the loss, the distance in meaning between the first ring and its replacement, right? According to the structure of analysis I have given, the spiritual energy, Geistliche, if we can say that, which creates this personalized kind of meaning, might be termed creative fidelity, a peculiar form of act that must rise beyond the level of mere constancy in order to confront and overturn the anonymity of other forms of cultural existence. The fidelity embodied in the ring must not just be a mere declaration of constancy, till death do us part, and so on. It must be an opening up to an experience of this person as radically non-anonymous, negatively speaking, and as available and present, to put it positively, logically. It is perhaps simultaneously a making oneself available, even as it is also an allowing the partner to be available. And in the power of my own fidelity toward availability, I find that the meaning of my partner as present now becomes available to me. Such an act is hard to isolate in itself, as all actions of spirit must be, but we can feel the force of its effects as it shapes the cultural world around us. Uh, <coughs> one of these effects is in the personalized... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of those effects <coughs> is in the personalization of some objects, in this case a ring, that are used to symbolically reflect my fidelity back to me. In the presence of the wedding ring, I become aware of my own free spiritual power toward fidelity. Just as for Kant, the experience of the sublime reveals my spiritual power or of judgment to myself. My fidelity is thus creative of the meaning of this ring, a meaning that is simultaneously arbitrary, as all symbols are, and also radically integral to the existence of my life as meaningfully lived. Such personalized cultural symbols that have this reflective power are characterized in their intuitive appearance, I have argued, by the presence of spatiality of responsibility, temporality of hope, and a numerality of community. To intuitively uh, experience a personalized wedding ring, to experience it as a personalized object in a personalized horizon, rather than as a linguistic, economic, mythic, and so on, I enter into a particular form of spatiality. When considered personally, the ring is not spatialized in mathematical terms or as a sacred object. It opens up a space of responsibility. This kind of space of responsibility is the spatial manifestation of my creative fidelity. Uh, creative fidelity enters space as a gathering or a coalescence of my responsibility. In committing myself, in making myself available, this ring takes up space and looms large on the plane of my responsibility. So this is a very intense peak of responsibility that allows me to differentiate it from other things that I'm less responsible to or re less represent my responsibility. Mm. The ring is a, concre is a concretion of responsibility in a plane of fluctuating responsibilities. Fine, fine, fine. Likewise, the ring moves through a temporal flux that is not measured in seconds, minutes, and so on. It moves through a time stream of hope. Our statements concerning the space of responsibility find analogs in the temporal plane. The ring occupies, quote unquote, a certain time in the ongoing unfolding of my hopeful being. The path that the ring cuts through mythic or mathematical time perhaps as a sacred object or as tarnishing with age, is not the same path the ring cuts through hopeful time. The ring opens up a horizon of hope that pushes into, onto the internal, even as it is concretized into a hopeful moment that must constantly renew itself through an ongoing act of fidelity. It is both eternal and ephemeral. The hope of everlasting fidelity intermingled with the hope of sustaining a momentary act of fidelity even into the next moment. Finally, the numeric intuition of the wedding ring must also be accounted for. As creative fidelity numeralizes, it creates intuitive objects on the plane of what I have called community. Thus, a wedding ring is not only an object pregnant with responsibility and hope, but also with community. It is traditional <coughs> enough to see the meaning of the ring as two becoming one, and this is in a sense true, but is not the entirety of community. For even as the ring symbolizes a synthesis of the parts into a whole communion, it is still a communion, which necessarily entails a lack of identity. The parts are brought into relation as a whole, but they are brought into that whole as parts. The discreteness of each person is not subsumed in the synthesis of the new community. The community exists only in the pure equilibrium of the parts as parts, but in communion. This is the demand of number, that the synthesis be purely equaled by the analysis, that the movements into whole and part are perfectly matched. Thus, the wedding ring has this dimension as well. It is pregnant with responsibility, symbolic pregnancy. 
uh, with responsibility and hope, but also with this purely equal coming together parts of, in communion. So that's the wedding ring. I think we have time. Yeah, I'm just going to do it. I'm talking for a long time. I apologize. Okay. That's the wedding ring example. Now I want to talk about Alice from Alice in Wonderland, right? Uh, in the case of a liter literary character such as this, we consider not just the creative fidelity of the author toward the character during the writing process, but also the fidelity of the reader, uh, and then even the fidelity of Alice herself. So I'm not going to be talking about uh, how you know uh, Lewis Carroll displays fidelity when he was writing her, although I think that he does. I'm not going to talk about how when audiences read her time and time again, they display fidelity, although I think that that's true. I'm going to take the more interesting case of how does Alice actually embody fidelity in the work, right? Uh, at least as it concerns Alice's personalized meaning, not to speak of whatever linguistic, mythic, or other meanings she might have, Alice exists spatially in the field of responsibility. Alice demands a certain response in the reader. She exists within a certain space of responsibility. She, de she demands respect, and that demand is a concretion of responsibility on the relevant plane. Not all literary characters elicit responsibility, but this one does. She bends or intensifies the field of responsibility. On this basis, some things are disrespectful to the character of Alice. You could not put her into a, a World War II narrative, for example, uh, as to do so would be to dis disrespect the character herself. Carol is responsible to Alice, the reader is responsible to Alice, and Alice herself must be responsible. There are a number of instances throughout the work where Alice must take responsibility for, hopefully we've read uh, Alice in Wonderland, right? Uh, for the tarts, for the rattle, for the painted cards, for offending the queen, and so on. Whether it is right or wrong to expect Alice to take responsibility in any of these cases is beside the point, which Wonderland instinctively <laughs> understands. The fact that she does take responsibility, or at least feels the call of responsibility, is key for transforming the alien and impersonal Wonderland into a personalized world. Uh, so just a real quick uh, thing here. I'm asking the qu two questions, the two layers here of generality. One, why do so many people find Alice and Alice in Wonderland as a story to be so personal to them? That's the question. And then two, how does the story itself uh, demonstrate personal, personal experience? So when Alice goes to Wonderland, why does she understand it as this very personal, uh, immediate, you know, full, full, of, full of personality, right? So there's both levels of generality here. Okay, so that's uh, responsibility. So she's respon all these instances in the story, she's res for the tarts, for the card painting, you know, like responsibility is this theme that comes up again and again, right? Which, because she answers and is responsible to the queen or to the Mad Hatter or to the whatever, she feels this as a very personal experience while she's there, right? Similarly, for those who experience her as personalized, Alex exists within a temporal duration of hope. Alice's own hope, pushed to the maximal eternal, is Wonderland itself as a horizon in which Alice finds herself, and I myself participate along with Alice. Wonder, Thalmazine, right, philosophy, uh, wonder itself is the hope, and my fidelity to wonder sustains the hope inherent in Wonderland. Not only does this allow for my own horizon of personalized hope, but it sustains Alice through her journey as well, leading her from wonder to wonder. Together, we both hope, myself and Alice, uh, and it is this hope that characterizes the unique temporality of Wonderland. Even the Mad Hatter and crew, stuck at tea time, are eternally hopeful, and thus able to carry on in their usual merry fashion. It is this more than anything that shows that mechanical time is not the driving force here. So Wonderland doesn't, uh, you know, function according to mechanical time. It functions according to hope, right? Uh, even stuck at tea time, time goes on, so long as that time is hopeful in character. Alice is unsure of herself, stuck between child and adult, but Wonderland teaches her that as long as hope exists, things will move along. Thus, as with responsibility, we find that Alice's personality arises out of a shared hope between Carol, the reader, and Alice herself. Carol and the reader's hope must be assumed, but Alice's hope is inherent in the fabric of Wonderland itself. Uh, ta, ta, ta. Just as Alice takes responsibility and learns to hope in Wonderland, she also forms community with the various inhabitants. When confronted with increasingly unusual circumstances, Alice maintains a natural curiosity and seeks to commune with the inhabitants of Wonderland. Even if the inhabitants are mad, Alice struggles to form community with them, in a sense becoming slightly mad herself. 
perhaps manifested as her continual inability to recite nursery rhymes, poems, riddles, so on. This drive to connect, to belong, to participate in a community personalizes Wonderland for Alice, just as her taking responsibility and learning to hope does. Tellingly, it is the moment that Alice feels herself above or superior to the community of Wonderland during the trial at the end, right? That Alice abruptly finds herself back in the regular world. You're nothing but a pack of cards, she yells, and suddenly the court turns back into cards after all and she wakes up from her dream beneath the tree. When she can no longer see herself as part of this wonderland, she abruptly is not. All of the personalized experiences she has been through immediately become mundane, regular rabbits, the familiar sound of farm animals, and so on. In that moment, Alice's responsibility, her hope, and her place in the community all vanish in an instant simultaneously. To my mind, this is a wonderful example of Carol's insight into the nature of creative fidelity. The reason that all of these vanish concurrently is that they are all nourished by the same stream, so to speak, creative fidelity. Without Alice's creative fidelity, manifested as her responsibility to the inhabitants, her continual hope, and her presence in the community, Wonderland vanishes like a puff of smoke. The objects that constituted Wonderland, rabbits, cards, mice, tea parties, and so on, have not vanished, but their existence as personally meaningful has, in fact, vanished. That's the end. Did it. Okay, talked for a long time. I'll bet I'm not the only one who's having a much easier time with the wedding ring than with Alice. Are you? I think Alice is such well, an interesting Well, I can see example. why you think you have to do that. I don't have to do it. Well, I no, just I, want I, to. I think if you're going to have a, a, a sort of a, a full account of personal space, you're going to have to get into why it is that this story and not that story or this exactly. character and not that character. Because Which was, the, by the way, the, know, the driving this, question for me because I yeah, like to write novels yeah. and these sorts of things. I was like, why are some characters so personal and right. others are not? Right. And, and, and of course... If you're going to give a full account, then that has to be part of it, too. It's just so much easier to see it in the case of something that concretizes perceptually and conceptually. Right. Well, and I admit that, and I uh, skipped over my whole <laughs> argument yeah. for, like, because it is strange, like, okay, so you're talking about intuition, which is objects within space, time, and number. Mm -hmm. Alice is an imaginary character. Yeah, exactly. That's How can an I'm... imaginary character occupy space, time, and number? Mm -hmm. But then, of course, my answer is, well, uh, if you're Descartes, then she can't, because it's not <laughs> space in the scientific sense. But obviously, she does, right? Like, uh, and so, but it's just a different kind of talk, a different way of speaking. But actually, in some ways, it explains why Kassir goes with number instead of causality. And of course, you're only talking about the level of intuition. Right. You're not talking about perception, and right. you're not talking about conception. Right. Uh, but it explains why, that when he thinks about cause, and he realizes that, well, that's tied to myth in the sense that, uh, that, that not only do myths give reasons or explanations for why things are the way they are, but there's also magic on the other side of that, which becomes right. science. And it's, a, it's the exercise of the will in the presence of you know, yeah. a nature that's got resistance to it to that kind of will. And so you can see, he's going, wow, man, the causality thing, it doesn't cover things like Alice. Yeah. Number is very weird. In a sense, like, there's a way of interpreting Kassir, I don't actually think this is the case, but that number is his, like, Hegelianizing Kant's pure intuitions, right? <coughs> Basically, he's saying space and time need a sublation, right? Mm -hmm. And number will be that sublation or something like that, but... Yeah, I don't read him that way either. Uh, yeah, but it... it well... No, he says he uh, he chooses number because he for about the same reasons that you point out, which is number covers causality and causality doesn't cover things like Alice. Yeah. Um, and so when you think about what does it take for something to become countable, it has to come into the 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 either the physical or the conceptual realm. Determinate concept innumerable, determinate perception innumerable, intuition. That's the hard one. What does mm -hmm. it mean for something to be innumerable as an intuition? They seem to all just bleed one into the other, but, I mean, you're making out a case. It's like, no, some of them take on personality, mm -hmm. and that might be one way to begin to get your mind around what we do when we <laughs> create for ourselves an object as personal. However, that leads to my question. Okay. The idealist. 
Um, uh, Jared is a fairly unapologetic idealist. And so all the creativity is coming from this energy of Geist uh, for, uh, uh, for you. Whereas it seems to me like you just, the community, the real community just disappeared into your personal, into your personalizing process. Uh, the real community, uh, I would say, so I'm using the word real in a loaded way, of okay. course. But the real community is, is the cloud of witnesses that watches you get married, oh. not the way that you enumerate them in order to personalize the experience for yourself. First of all, I'm a transcendental idealist, which is, a pra <laughs> is the pragmatist way of being an idealist, yeah, 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 by yeah, the yeah, way. Yeah. But uh, I'm pushing you. No, okay. We so got you wanna, energies of spirit. You want to talk like, about Royce? Then yeah, is the yeah. community real or is it ideal? Both. Okay. Which is it, first? It couldn't be one without being the other. Fair enough, right? But the community is ideal. Oh yeah. Right. It's also real. It is, of course, just like Kant <laughs> says, right? But how do you know the ideal? You know it from the real first, right? But you you yeah, look at the real and then you. Uh, you reflectively, you know, uh, toss out this idea, this symbol of the ideal community, which you have to build from empirical observation. This is just yep. radical empiricism. Right? Right, 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 right. We've had this conversation before. <laughs> um, but it's not radical and empirical enough to suit me. But anyway, right. you you are the most idealistic and idealizing person I know. <laughs> And then you pretend as if you're not an idealist, which is nonsense. Okay. You know you're absolutely. Right. I know I am. Yeah. He's no, a good. He's a good old empiricist, is what Randy is. Uh, I was thinking, you know, you, you really right. like what you do with uh, Marcel here, you know, because Marcel has a, you know, where you're talking about. Uh, mythological space. Mm -hmm. I always think about when uh, Disneyland tried to take over part of Bull Run Battlefield. Mm. You remember this back in the 80s? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that you know, shouldn't be allowed. Yeah, it wasn't because uh, people <laughs> yeah. went crazy over it. Because, yeah. you know, for Disneyland, it's Cartesian space. It's right. homogenous. For, you know, even though this only happened in like. Uh, Four days in 1861 and 62. It's mm -hmm. sacred space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Marcel has this uh, response to uh, Heidegger. Mm -hmm. You know, Heidegger you know, is being toward death, and then Marcel has this, thou at least shall not die, uh -huh. which is what you're talking about mm -hmm. when you're talking about creative fidelity mm -hmm. and hope. But he's also related to um, Schelling. Mm -hmm. Um, I love Schelling, by the yeah, way. Yeah, he wrote his uh, licence on Schelling and Coleridge, mm -hmm. and that actually brings you to your second, to your third thing, the, the number mm -hmm. one, uh, which is the two become one and remain two. But remember what yeah what Schelling, I mean, what Colbert, what let Marcel attempts to to avoid idealism. His kind, not mine. Yeah, because you know he starts out. I don't have he, an idealism. I mean, he's very close to. He reads Bradley at mm -hmm. first, and he reads Hawking, and he mm -hmm. writes that book about Royce. But mm -hmm. Hawking is the guy he likes the most. But he really is close to Bradley. Mm -hmm. uh, but he and Bradley is way too idealistic for him. But but it's that's why he writes the fragments, mm -hmm. because it should come together. And when he does his Gifford lectures on. Uh, um, the broken world. The, the, no, 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 not being mystery of being. Mystery, yeah. of being. Yeah. mystery of being. He's really concerned about that because he thinks it's way too systematic, and because the one has to constantly fall. That off. Bradley is too systematic, or no, what? Marcel is worried about doing the Gifford lectures because he doesn't. Because oh. I mean, he's always written metaphysical right. journals. Yeah, yeah. All the books are metaphysical mm -hmm. journals, and then that one he's got to systematize it because he's afraid it's going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. You'll just have a one. Yeah. And this way, you could be a radical empiricist. Too. I think I am. I, I don't know why Randy has to say that I'm not. I don't know what makes a radical empiricist different than a transcendental idealist, but that's a conversation for a different day, I think. Right? Oh, I mean, how many times have we had this argument? I don't know. Let's just in not, various forms. Yeah, out. let's just not say. Let's not just do it again. Uh, no. Let's 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 enter into the cultural power of personal objects. Right. Did, was there a person? A yeah, specific the, question. Well, there. Or? <laughs> yeah, I went on and on and on and lost the question. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering about you know, the end with Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. You know, and because um, is. Um, Keep thinking of that Woody Guthrie song, I Ain't Got No Home in This World Anymore. Mm -hmm. So is the 
what you're saying then, when you lose hope, mm -hmm. and you you lose your world. I mean, she loses her relation to the world. So the you world lose your personal person. world. You, you the world becomes depersonalized. Uh -huh. It still exists scientifically. It might still exist linguistically, mathematically, in lots of different forms, right? Still real. Still, yeah. I mean, well, what, for whatever real means, but. Uh, so for Kassir, it exists in all these other ways, and you have relationship to it through those sim symbolizing pathways, something like that. Um, but it, it's no longer personal, right? And home is, a, is an inherently personal world, word, right? Mm -hmm. Home is not just a house over there or something like this. Home Next is, to another house and with yeah, a different, or something like, built at a different So the rate. house is still there, but you don't have the home anymore, right? Uh, or like, so, for like, if you grow up in, we say, a broken home, right? It's not that you don't have a place to go at night. It's not that you don't go and eat dinner, maybe even with your parents or whomever, but you don't really have a home, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and in order to have a home, you need responsibility and hope and community, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Really so when the ethical, convincing. <laughs> when her ethical relationship breaks down mm -hmm. to Wonderland. Yeah. I, I mean, to me, that's sort of the, the philosophical point of the story, right? It's a question of, how does a child learn to become an adult? Child, autom like, stereotypically sees the world in a very personal way, right? And so Alice is a child, and she sees, and she goes along with all this nonsense, and everyone is mad, right? And she's willing to perfectly throw herself into hopefulness and responsibility to this nonsense, and community, and community with this nonsense, right? Because uh, the themes are all about kind of growing up, right? And becoming an adult as an adolescent. And then... That moment is sort of the this loss of innocence, where the world becomes just regular rabbits and regular tea parties, and not special, personal ones that are unique <laughs> and meaningful to me in this very specific sense. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so, if we want to recover that, uh, or to preserve it in the places that we do have it, uh, then we need to maintain this responsibility and hope and community, um, or else... It's not like the house goes away, but it's not a home. Mm -hmm. And it's not like the rabbit's not still a rabbit, but it's not the white rabbit with the pocket watch and the, you know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. it's not the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Does that help answer yes. your question? Yeah, no, that, that, you, I, you've given me a very different understanding of uh, Alice in okay. Wonderland cool. than me I too. ever had before. Me too, yeah. That's good. Uh, so I saw Ralph and then Kevin, I think. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the presentation. It's a very rich, uh, texture of analysis and there are a lot of things I could talk about but <clears throat> I want to focus on the way you use the term responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday I I heard that they executed this guy in Georgia mm -hmm. whose case was controversial and of course executing a killer is a response to mm -hmm. and sure. it reflects the response of in many cases, a hatred and, yeah. and anger at the person. And it, it reminded me of um, this high school baseball team of made of mine who grew up to be a serial killer. Huh. And um, so the a lot of people, do, they do respond, because you use responsibility and mm -hmm. then correlate that with the word response. Right, yeah. Uh, and I want to sort of get more specific about that. So a lot of people respond to my friend Walraven with hatred and <coughs> anger uh, because of what he did. Knowing things that I know about him, his father beat him in the head every day throughout his childhood, sexually abused him and all that. Um, it seems less appropriate to me to think that it's his fault, mm -hmm. that he's the way he is. So to be angry, to hate him for what he is, would be sort of like getting angry at, like when you stump your foot on a chair, and your first response is to kick the chair mm -hmm. because you're so mad at the chair. Yeah. And then you, rem you remind yourself that the chair is not a person. It's not the chair's fault that you that your show mm -hmm. hit it. Or is uh, it a person? Well, maybe, yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to talk some right. about the other side of that as well. But um, in the sense that you're talking about, 
I mean, I think you you would distinguish. Okay, that's that's what I'm getting at. The chair is in a personal space for me, my, for, in terms of my personhood. Mm -hmm. uh, in the way I understand your analysis, but the way I respond to the chair is different from the way it would be if I thought it was the chair's fault that it's the way it is. Mm -hmm. But because I understand the mechanics of physical nature uh, well enough to think that it's not the chair's fault, I don't feel that it's appropriate to have that kind of response to it. The and kicking, the, you mean? Uh, well, in the same way, I don't think it's appropriate to have that kind of response to my friend Jim Walraven because he, it's not his fault that he's the way he is. There are things that made him into being the way he is. And because I don't, uh, I mean, because I look at it that way, I can, I can empathize with him in a way that people who attribute more responsibility for what he is to him could not do. Mm -hmm. And um, so in a sense, by putting him more in the category, I mean, connecting him to the category system of the non-personal, I'm able to have the personal response of empathy that I couldn't have before. Uh, this response, empathy is one type of response. So I just like to know um, when you say responsibility, what types of responses are you talking mm -hmm. about? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so this is kind of the question of, I mean, can a serial killer be personal? Right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be a good thing, right? Like, some things are very personal to me for negative reasons, right? Like, not just, I mean, a wedding ring could become just as easily negative as positive, something like this, right? But the fact is that I do have a unique relationship to it or something like this. Um, so that's kind of one question that sounds like that's part of the, what you're asking. It's like, well, does a response have to be like a positive response? You know, like... Uh, taking care of or doing this kind of stuff mm -hmm. um, so that's something that's I, I agree I think is interesting I don't think that personal objects have to be nice or happy or friendly or something mm -hmm. like this right I'm Kevin you know right like with your example from your paper right um, so that's one thing and another thing when we start talking about these ethical issues it's it's very complicated right because um, what you're observing in your friend is that um, through because of a variety of experiences that he had, his relationship to his parents and these kinds of things, he lost the ability to really have responsibility and hope and community with his world. Does that make sense? I think it's good. Right? And so you see that, and then you sort of understand... Um, I don't know, we have this tendency to treat criminals as if they're not persons or something like this, right? Which is problematic in a lot of ways. Um, but the, part of it is this, right? Is that we see something like that and we understand, well, this is a person who's lost their ability to sort of be a person, right? Like, they've fallen out of responsibility and hope and community with most things, right? Now, probably even the most brutal serial killer has some responsibility and some hope and some community, right? Um, but we, we call into question that when we, like, you know, say that, oh, they're a criminal or, oh, they're, they're this, that, or the other. Um, does that make any sense? Yeah, but the thing is, I can still empathize with of course. him because he still is a person. Right. In spite of all of, all of the stuff that is going on that would... I, but I get what you're saying. Yeah. Like, when people hate him or or get angry at him, that's that's also putting him in the realm. Right. They've fallen out of responsibility and hope and community with him in a way that maybe you haven't. Does that make sense? Well, no, I think I would say that in terms of your uh, way of thinking that they are responding to him in a personal space, even if their right. response is hatred. And exactly. But they've... So I, I agree with you. I think the response is there, but definitely the hope has been lost, and the community probably. 
right? Well, the response is twisted, and the hope is thin, and the and, right. and, and the community is transient. Yeah, I mean, the the if the hope were still present, the, there would there would be rehabilitation, right? It wouldn't be the death penalty or something like this. Well, and also for me, it makes me feel a little alienated from the community. Mm, sure. To realize that because they're treating a, someone, uh, they're treating something that you see as a person in a dehumanizing, well, depersonalizing in a, way. In a, an unnecessarily punishing. Right. Unnecess I mean, of course they have to get him away from, he was right. strangling women in their bathtubs. Yeah. They have to stop him from doing that. Right. But, um, and, and this is a tricky thing because you're going to say, yes, but even with that, I still feel a sense of responsibility to him. And maybe that's unique to you because you grew up with him. I still feel a sense of hope, like he still has a future. And maybe I still even feel a sense of community with him. Now, not a strong community or something like that, but I see my own humanity reflected back at me, and I understand that he's still being much like me, and that he had all these traumas. And then you're upset that other people have fallen out of responsibility and hope and community with him, and they don't see him as a person. So, so you would say when you empathize with somebody, that in itself calls on you to have a responsibility toward that person. <sighs> Empathy is expressive. It doesn't rise to that level of intuition. Uh, well, I mean, we could talk about it in different ways. Mm -hmm. I, I would say yes, but that doesn't mean that the response is predetermined, like how you respond. You could respond positively, negatively. The response could be a lot of different things, right? This is kind of the, the Levinas point, like the face of the other is there, right? Mm -hmm. And there is, that elicits a response in you of some, of some kind, right? If it was just nothingness, like this table might not elicit a response. I walk in the room, I don't even pay attention to the table or something like that, right? The way that a work of art might not, right? Like, I might see that work, and I'm like, oh, I'm arrested by it, in a sense. Now, I might hate it, I might love yeah. it, but it, it's but the per... hatred kills the empathy to a great extent. Yeah, but it's still a response, right? Mm -hmm. Does yeah. that make, does that make sense? The, I mean, your, your questions yeah, so, are great questions. Okay, but you were using the term responsibility, so yeah. I want to connect the response to the responsibility. Exactly, yeah, and so, um, I, I had to glaze over this quickly, but I, I'm using responsibility in both a subjective sense and in an objective sense, right? So I, as the subject, have a feel the sense of responsibility to this thing, but the object itself is also responsible in the sense that it elicits responses in me. So respon I said this, but it was very quick. Responsibility in that sense is like an objective quality that the object has, right? It, has the, it possesses responsibility. Meaning, like, that painting possesses responsibility. It has the capacity to elicit response, mm -hmm. right? And so, as a subject, I am responsible to the world, but the world also elicits response as an objective thing. Does that make sense? So you got this Hegelian subject-object kind of stuff in the background. But you really interesting questions of, like, well, what exactly is the nature of the response that the world elicits from you? Um, and without thinking about it much, I guess I would say, as long as there is a response, then that rises to the level of the personal. It doesn't so it have to be... It not necessarily be a moral response. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Does that, does that seem right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Kevin, yeah. Before I even get to my question, I just sort of wanted to piggyback up that. Uh -huh. It sounds like a lot of what he's talking about is intensification of an experience. Mm -hmm. So you think... Yeah, you know, there's this you know, Dewey and... Yeah. You know this person from high school and they are you experience in such and such way, and then you find out that they're a serial killer, and you feel violated. Right. And you respond to that in a, in a particular way. Right. Exactly. And, um, just just as yeah, the example of stubbing your toe on a piece of furniture, I think, is almost a, a confusion of two different modes of experience. You know, right. The spatial, temporal, mm -hmm. uh, everyday understanding. Mm -hmm. This is how. This is where this thing has been, and I confuse that with my personal experience, and I stub right. my toe. And these two things come into conflict, and therefore I kick the furniture. Right. Um, and, and it is an intensity, exactly. But the question is, like, what distinguishes this intensity from maybe a poetic intensity or an aesthetic intensity or a religious intensity? Like, I could have a religiously intense experience, but it's not necessarily personal. I mean, people, you can have imperson, impersonal 
religious experiences, right? Yeah. And so there has to be a difference. And so then the question is like, okay, this is an intense thing. It's a very rich cultural experience. Yeah. How do we talk about this intensity in, in a way that doesn't just turn it into something else? And I think that when a lot of people find out that someone they knew in high school becomes a serial killer, they might say that that's an intrusion of some, some, something profane. Yeah, well, we could. There is sort of a mythic characteristic to that, yeah. but then we start treating it as as myth, not as this personal relationship, right? Yeah. Uh, which is fine to do, but it's a different it's a different framework, right? So he, he asked you to talk about responsibility. I wanted to talk you to talk about hope. Actually. Cool. Um, because it sounds like it's a value laden hope, and it sounds like you're positive towards hope. And I wonder about uh, those people who take the negative view of hope. Yeah. Who's at the bottom of Pandora's box or jar, right. and whether that means that hope is a trick, you know, because it's a jar full of evils, or one positive thing in that jar. Um, one definition that I've heard of hope that has always stuck with me that I really like was uh, it's a longing for a future condition over which we have no agency. Mm -hmm. So that it's a negative concept. Right. So I'd just like you to sort of explain the uh, word choice for hope. Well, so the, the choice of the words is because I'm trying to use Marcellian language, mm. right? Um, and so that does kind of put me in a certain direction because he's a, sort of a Christian existentialist. And so these words like responsibility and hope, uh, they are chosen to kind of go along with this creative fidelity concept and to make sense in sort of a Marcellian framework. Um, <coughs> but that being said, like... I, I, I agree that it seems as if there's a positive spin on this that like it's always better to hope than to not hope or something like that right and and that's sort of the danger of choosing words and this is kind of the same question but on hope for responsibility like by responsibility does that have to mean something good or not and and the same for hope i would say no not necessarily right but hope is this like existential ontological category right it's like the <coughs> the awareness of the future and the past and and the openness of that and also but does that make sense and so like um hope is just the fact that you get up and that you take a step and it, does that make sense? like that's hope right well the counter example i have for this is you don't hope that a plane is going to land you expect that a plane is going to land mm -hmm. or that if uh terrorists take over your plane you can hope that things work out for the best or you can try to make something happen so mm -hmm. there there are places where hope has no place. You, uh, mm -hmm. where you can't hope for things to happen. You have to try to make things happen. Well, but with Marcel, it, engagement is related to hope. That's mm -hmm. what we're, you're using the word differently. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so uh, you can go, we can go ahead and say, yes, you hope that in that case. But it's not like a personal experience, right? When you, like, if I hope that the plane doesn't go down or does go down, or like whatever the negative examples, right? Um, you're not treating the plane as like this personal thing to you or something like that, right? Are we? I mean, as a passenger, I will hope the plane doesn't go down, but I am hoping that the pilot does not hope the plane doesn't go down. <laughs> okay, I might have <laughs> lost the thread of this, but... Having no control over the plane, I will hope. No, I think with Marcel, though, it would, the hope would relate almost more closely to the pilot than it would to you. Okay. Maybe yeah, go he ahead. Has, he's involved with making this happen. Yeah, Marcel wouldn't add that last stipulation mm -hmm. that it's hope about something over which you have, have no control. control. Right. Yeah, that's like uh, me hoping the uh, <coughs> Cardinals win the World <laughs> Series next year. I mean, yeah, that's that's just not what he talks about. He talks about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I guess this is this like hope is this is an active kind of a thing right not just like a passive or negative capacity something and so there is like this existential hoping is an act yeah. and so this is why the word creative fidelity fidelity is a, a promising it's uh i like the word fidelity more than the word faith right because faith is sort of passive right it's just this thing that i possess or not fidelity is it's active it's a promising it's a no i i will be here i will be faithful does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and so, like, that's what I like about Marcel a lot, of, as opposed to some, I mean, I like existentialism generally, but I like this active side of it, which says, you know, like, um, it's not about having faith in, like, a Kierkegaardian sense. It's, it's about fidelity. Yeah, Do you... Well, no, go ahead. I was just thinking of uh, Manasseh's battlefield. Hmm. You have the hope that that actually mean, meant something. 
means that you will go out and stop Disney. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, there's this activist. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and so does if that makes any sense? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the place where I've heard the negative articulation of hope is uh, I hope that the environment will improve. Mm -hmm. When in reality, I can actually contribute to making the environment improve. Right. I'm talking about it from a passive, you know, I have no control. Over yeah, it. so if we, if we want to take the Marcellian standpoint and try yeah. and use this language carefully, then let's reserve hope for this active thing. Right. And you would, you would instead say, like, it would be nice if, in sort of the passive voice, or I wish, we, you could, we could choose another word, but if you actually hope that the environment will improve, like, if you, not, that's not just, like, I'm saying that intellectually, like, spiritually, existentially, like, I have hope, I have faith, but, like, fidelity. Like, I am actually, does that make sense, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Basically, I mean, it's basically the environmental use of hope that I've been using it is in disagreement with uh, Mouse. Uh huh. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. this it's it's really Pauline. It's, you know, mm. it's faith, hope, the and hope. charity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and charity of, of these charity is the greatest because you're going to have to get out and do something. Yeah. But if you don't have, if, you know, I mean, if you can't have hope, it's hard to have charity. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a difference between faith, hope, well, and charity. But the, yeah. The, the example that Marcel starts with is the mother who's told that her son was killed but she still believes he'll come back. Mm. Yeah. The hope against hope or something like that. That's more Paul. Mm. Mm. Although he does talk about hope in a positive sense in other places, that, that is, that the, the, the hope for uh, the e eternal life is not hope against hope. It's, it's a given. Uh, it's, it's a constructive hope. It's something, it's almost a kind of knowledge. Um, yeah. uh, and so... Uh, so anyway, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, the, I, I like the idea of hope as a temporally extended mode of personal being. Right. And, and I'm almost convinced by all three of your arguments, the only reason that I'm not totally convinced is that it just seems to me like it's too tidy. Yeah, I know, right? The um, systematizer. Yeah, yeah, it's just too tidy. There's got to be more to it than that. Uh, uh, and, of course, then it occurs to me, it's like, all right, I have a tendency to think of a of, of person in objective terms. Um, and then the personalizing is what the community and the house and the guitar and the piano do to us. Mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, both, that of course. Personalize, of course it is both. But, but I'm always suspicious when the personalizing activity originates in some kind of subjectivity, yeah. even if it isn't the modern subject, yeah. which you have well, successfully this was a big avoided. Thing, but, and like this, my committee yeah. all made this point, and Randy yeah. all made this point. I'm like, look, I, this is where I'm starting from. I'm starting yeah. from the subject. You can yeah. start from the object. Um, I always start there because it makes people angry. <laughs> yeah, well. Because they think they can be persons on their own power, and it isn't true. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it's like the first point is you're not a person unless I think right. you are. And, but, and, and, and that, of course, that's a challenging right. way to put it. And the reason, it, but it's like, the reason for this difference is that you start from the standpoint mm -hmm. of ethics. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? It's true. And yeah. I start from the standpoint of aesthetics. Yeah, yeah something that's, like that's not going to work for me. <laughs> well, but it does. But you just don't start I there. I include it. You include it. it and yeah, I include right. ethics. Yeah, but yeah. So the, the question I'm asking is like, how do I personalize my world? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, let's say I'm a person living in modern society in a completely impersonal world. I wake up every day and it's just blah and it's nothingness and it's whatever. And I'm an existentialist or I'm an artist and I, or to take the standpoint of an artist. How do I make a work of art that means something as opposed to just a collection of paint or musical notes or something like that, right? Or words on a page. Just tossing off another one. Right. So I'm starting from that standpoint of like the subject. I want to create a book that is meaningful and personal to people and not one that's just wrote trash or something like this, mm -hmm. right? So starting from that standpoint is like, or from the existential standpoint of, I have a bland, boring life and nothing is particularly meaningful to me and I don't really care much about anything in particular and I don't want to live that life. Mm -hmm. From that standpoint, and now of course your answer would be find community, which exactly, is, and I've got community in there, right? Yeah. So, uh, but like yeah. I, you say, well, um, if you want the world to mean something, you have to find, you have to be responsible, you have to have hope, and you have to have community, right? And you have to find whatever that is 
Now that could like you'll never create it from your own resources. That's my point. I know. And that's I, the thing I, I worry about. I know that that's yeah. your point, and yeah. I like. And of course, part of me agrees, but then part of me says, "Yeah, but like, we can't just throw out the individual." No, I'm not saying throw it. Yeah, I know. This is, this is uh, go back to your example of the mother who believes her son. Yeah, we'll which was back. Marcel's example. That was his starting example mm -hmm. but, of the whole analysis. But it's not. Uh, her hope is not a vain hope. It's related to that idea, thou at least shall not die, that right. somehow the universe mm. will cooperate with your activity. Yeah, she keeps him alive as a person yeah. for herself. Yeah, right. and, and, and you know, from the point of view of... of from a uh, scientist, that's yeah, nonsense, this, right? This is, yeah, from, you, from what, you know, when I brought up the uh, Manassas example, you know, the, that <clears throat> this means something <clears throat> in the whole of being. You know, uh, that it's not just... Uh, homogenous space. Right. And it's not just um, that he's dead. Yeah. He's one of the millions that got blown up in the war. You know, because uh, Marcel was involved, like James and Berkson, in parapsychology and all sorts mm. of things like that when he was working for the Red Cross during the war. You know, it's, yeah. But that, do anything you can. That Camus or Sartrean moment where you go, you know what? You want Manassas to mean something in a hundred years? Give it to Disney. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I hate to be absurdist, but that might be the best path, uh, is go on and give it to Disney, because you don't really know. You think that's a profanation, and yet they might not only do a respectable job, that might be the only shot it has that's still meaning well, something and, in and, another and, hundred and, you know, years. And, and like yeah. you say, I mean, you could you yeah. could argue that what the daughters of the Confederacy did mm -hmm. at the end of the nineteenth century with all those Confederate mo monuments was perhaps the biggest profanation that was out there. Uh, ah, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and attempting to, yeah, yeah. I mean, it would persist, but would it persist? What would it persist as? Mm -hmm. Would it still be personal, or would it be impersonal? That's the question. Well, they do have a park somewhere where they're putting all those monuments. It's in Mississippi. Yeah. Well, of course. Oh, really? It's on private ground. They did this, private, they did this in Lithuania. Yeah. They, they, they oh, took, yeah, they, they turned it into a big public park. They took it into and, an amusement park. They took yeah, all the Lenin, Marx, uh, Stalin statues. Yeah, you can go there. Yeah, you can go there. Yeah, you can go there. You can look it up online. It's, it's like, wow, that looks, looks like fun. Lenin land. <laughs> uh, anyway, well, thank you, Jared. Okay. So we adjourn.